Good morning. I can, I can never tell if you can hear me. Does that work? Yes. Um, good morning. On behalf of President William A. Covino, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Cal State LA this morning. Um, a special welcome to our students and a special welcome to our guests and visitors. And it's a particular pleasure to welcome you to this particular event, which was jointly developed by the School of Criminal Justice and Criminalistics and the California Forensic Science Institute. It's the synergy between those two uh, programs and departments that I think are, is going to affect a lot of change on campus and off. I'd like to sp very specifically thank Catherine Roberts, whom you just heard from, and Kate Tellis, the chair, um, for their leadership of this event. And it should go noted that they're leading this event at what is probably the busiest time of the academic season. So a special thank you to you for your efforts. There is no better place, as far as I can see, to host an event like this than Cal State LA. The study and practice of social justice have long been a critical part of Cal State LA. This is the, the third university at which I have been an administrator and a faculty member, and um, I regularly note that social justice, the study of and issues related to it and the practice of it, is woven into the DNA of this campus in a way that I have not seen on very many campuses. Central to our mission is engagement, service, and the public good, and we enact this in many ways. First and foremost, by providing access to high quality, low cost degrees for low income, first generation students who often hail from underserved areas in our, in our local region. And more importantly, we couple that with completion. Uh, many of you probably saw earlier this year that Cal State LA was ranked number one um, uh, by a longitudinal study conducted by researchers from Stanford, Berkeley, and Brown University uh, rated us number one for the upward mobility of our graduates, in specific for taking students from the lowest quartile of income earners and bringing, or the quintile, and bringing, raising them in middle career to the highest quintile. So for us, we couple access with completion with upward mobility. And faculty research and events like this are also critical to that mission of engagement, service, and the public good because we want to bring together all of our communities, our, our academic community, our criminal justice community, our social services communities, uh, events like this that bring people together uh, to analyze um, and to study issues and problems are critical to our success. We are home to the Center for, the Engage, for Engagement Service and the Public Good, and they, they work with the community in many, many ways, but I just want to highlight one project that we're working on that is related to some of the conversation you'll have today or the work that you do outside of today. Um, we offer, through that center, the only in-person bachelor's degree program for incarcerated people in the state of California, for incarcerated men. We currently have 23 uh, students, um, uh, male students at Lancaster Prison who are pursuing their bachelor's degree in communication. This is also part of our larger effort to support the formerly incarcerated in getting their degrees here at Cal State LA. So it's part of a whole package of, uh, again, social justice serving particular groups of people. And then on a, on, a, on a more somber note, there's never been a better time, I think, or let me rephrase that, a more important or more critical time to affirm our commitment to social justice than the particular historical moment we're living in. I am a US historian, so I'm critically aware of these things. But in the face of the nas national problems, this, this morning I hear we might be going war to war with Korea, um, every morning it's a different, a, a different uh, a drama, um, Cal State LA is thriving. We are going to do the best we can in the face of the chaos around us. I'm happy to report that we're undergoing a bit of a renaissance here at Cal State LA, and that's built largely upon our remarkable faculty and our remarkable students. We've had record numbers of applications. We have over 55,000 applications to study here in the fall. That rep for the second year in a row, that represents the highest growth in applications of any California State University. We have record enrollments. Last fall, we welcomed near 28,000 students, and we expect to welcome the same number this fall. And we're making a dramatic investment in our tenure track faculty, trying to hire 50 new faculty each year. And these things, students and faculty, form the heart and the core of what we do. And we've reaffirmed that commitment to our students by pledging to the state of California that we will dramatically raise our graduation rates, again, linking access to attainment to upward mobility. Programs like this are key to our mission, bringing people together to share their research, their work, their experiences, their successes, their challenges, to exchange ideas, 
and all of this in service to our communities. We, we are deeply devoted to what, what our president calls applied research, things that we can then take and transform the places we work and the places we live. So again, um, I, I think there's no better place to host this. I'm deeply appreciative of the work that, that, that has brought you all here today. And I want to thank you for your attendance and participation. I know everyone in the room is equally busy. And uh, taking the time out for an event like this is really critically important. So a very warm welcome to Cal State LA. If they give you a break, take a walk around our beautiful campus. Our jacarandas are blooming. And take a walk around campus. Um, but enjoy your day and enjoy one another. And now I've slowed down the entire PowerPoint presentation by popping the batteries out of the clicker. <laughs> Thank you, Provost Mahoney. Welcome, everyone. My name is Kate Tellis. I'm an associate professor and currently serving as the director of the School of Criminal Justice and Criminalistics here at Cal State LA. On behalf of the school, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you so very much for joining us today. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Ron Vogel, the dean of the Rong Zhang Shu College of Health and Human Services, for his unwavering support of our school. We're very excited to host this forum today as a partnership between the California Forensic Science Institute and the School of Criminal Justice and Criminalistics. And a very warm and special welcome to our cohabitants in the Hertzberg Davis Forensic Science Center, the Los Angeles Police Department, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Our building is the true essence of interdisciplinarity and community partnerships, and we greatly appreciate opportunities such as this to collaborate. Promoting public awareness around justice issues is a key part of our school's mission. Today represents a special opportunity to examine the criminal justice and forensic science factors that both contribute to and reverse wrongful convictions. Our goal is to generate a dialogue and increase civic literacy. So whichever role we play, criminalist, law enforcement, prosecutor, defense attorney, social worker, advocate, or juror. We're better equipped to understand the limitations of the criminal justice system and work to make it better. And with that, I'll introduce the key player behind today's events, Dr. Katherine Roberts, professor, director of the criminalistics program, and executive director of the California Forensic Science Institute. So you can actually see we have a, a very compact schedule for you today. So in the interest of time, we're simply going to introduce the panelists, and then we ask that you'll refer to your program for their biographies. Also in the interest of time, if you could reserve your questions for our question and answer session at the conclusion of the panelists, of the third panel. Uh, thirdly, if you're not familiar with the layout of the Golden Eagle, just from a housekeeping standpoint, if you leave the building here, this is the only entrance and exit. Make a right, and there's a restroom, uh, just a short walk, walkway. There's also a restroom on the first floor and the ground floor. Lastly, out of respect for our presenters, if you'd please put your phones on silence. And I'm going to begin by introducing our first panel. First panelist is Professor Justin Brooks. Professor Brooks is the director of the California Innocence Project based in San Diego. And I just want to give a shout out because I really do acknowledge the Innocence Project's braving the five freeway on a Friday to come and see us today. So I, I can't thank you enough for that. Also, we have Dr. Iris Blandon Gitlin. She's running a little late, but she'll be giving our third presentation. And then thirdly, our very own professor from psychology Dr. Stephen Frander. So please welcome our panelists, and I'm going to ask Pro Professor Brooks to join us on the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like to introduce, I've, several of my staff members will be here a little later. They are probably brave in getting here. But I've got with me Raquel Cohen, who's a staff attorney in our office. Stand up, Raquel. Don't be shy. You're a lawyer. And Alyssa Bierkohl here as well. 
I'm going to talk, be talking about some cases today, and I always worry. People think, like, you know, how did I possibly get all these people out of prison? Well, I didn't. So I've got an amazing team of lawyers and law students, and I'm often the lucky one to be able to stand on their shoulders um, and do the press conferences and go to court. But they're all responsible for all the work we do. And we've also got here today even more special guests, three of our exonerated clients. We have Kim Long. Stand on up. Rafael Madrigal and Luis Vargas. And you're going to hear from them later. They've spent more than 35 years in prison between them for crimes they did not commit. And I also want to give a shout out because I'm so happy to see over in that corner the conviction review unit from the LA District Attorney's Office. And thank you for coming. And Luis, on the next break, just go hug every one of them individually. <laughs> because I don't know if you'd be here right now if it wasn't for them. So, and that's, that's a theme I want to talk about a lot today, about how we need to go about fixing the problems in the system, because that's what we're all about. We're about getting innocent people out of prison. We're not about grandstanding. We're not about promoting other agendas. I just said this to Luis, he said, he said, how are you doing, Justin? I said, same thing, looking for innocent people in prison and trying to get them out. <laughs> that's what we do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And this all started for me about 25 years ago. And I was teaching law school in Michigan. And I read a newspaper article about a woman who was sitting on death row in Illinois. And the article said that she was sentenced to death on a plea bargain. Okay, so for all you criminal justice students, see any issues with that? What potential issues with someone sentenced to death on a plea bargain? Anybody? It's two words, plea bargain, right? Bargain. So when I teach it to my law students to say, you never know if you got the best deal you could get. Well, you know you did not get the best deal you could get when you plead somebody out and they get sentenced to death. So I did not understand that the same way that you don't. So I went out to meet with her. And she was sitting on death row in Illinois. She's 21 years old. Um, she didn't speak English fluently. She didn't really know what had happened to her. And then she told me an amazing thing. She said, I'm innocent. And I'm just sitting there baffled. How could someone who's saying they're innocent have pled out and then been sentenced to death? And so I went back and told that same story that I just told you to my law students and said, there's this 21-year-old woman, she's sitting on death row, she's telling me she's innocent. Who wants to help out? And four brave, stupid souls raised their hands. And we went on this odyssey that ultimately led to me creating the California Innocence Project. Um, working hand in hand with these law students, I realized two things. First of all, even as a criminal defense attorney, I was shocked that someone could be sentenced to death on a case like this. Her lawyer had done no investigation at all into her case. Her lawyer had no experience doing any type of capital murder case. Um, he was just hired by her as a guy who lived in the neighborhood. She actually made a mistake I've seen over and over again where she fired a really good public defender, a woman who'd had years and years of experience doing capital murder trials because her friend said, you need a real lawyer, hire a private lawyer. And so they hire a guy in their neighborhood who doesn't know what he's doing. He gets a $10,000 retainer and goes in and pleads her straight up to double homicide. She then, on top of getting the worst lawyer in Chicago, which is a bold statement, she got the worst judge in Chicago, which is an even bolder statement, because Chicago leads the nation in judges incarcerated. Um, Chicago had an actual judge who was a known gang member when he took the bench. That's how crazy it is, because you can bring a lot of votes from your precinct in when you're a gang leader, and it was enough to negotiate for a judgeship. Um, so, but this guy had been a former homicide detective who went to law school at night, became a judge, was certified as unqualified all 20 years he was on the bench, um, ended up being sanctioned many, many times by the Illinois Supreme Court for things like leaving the bench during trials and telling them to carry on without him, little things like that. And so he just accepted this plea fully knowing that the defense and prosecution had never even met, had never even conferred on this case, and it was a straight-up plea to double homicide. So 
In the first day working on this case, we go to the crime scene, and I stand where the key witness said she saw this homicide occur, and I realize it's 400 feet away. It was at night. It was absolutely impossible for her to see what she said she saw. And what she said she saw was one woman pass a gun to my client who shot this one guy. And that's, by the way, literally like sitting in a football stadium behind one end zone with all the lights off at night and seeing someone pass a hot dog to someone behind the opposite end zone. It took me about six months to find this woman and found out, surprise, surprise, the one person looking out their window that night in Chicago, the one person who saw this murder just happened to be coincidentally the girlfriend of the victim. And of course, none of this was ever discovered because the case never went to trial and no investigation was done. So working on that case inspired me in two ways. Number one, I realized, oh my God, there are really innocent people in prison. This, and this is back then when you, know, you had Reuben Hurricane Carter and a few cases floating around, but this is before the hundreds of DNA exonerations. And the second thing I realized was the best way to work on these cases is to work with law students because they provide this tremendous resource. And the best way to teach someone to be a lawyer is by being a lawyer. Pretty much like every profession. Best way to learn it is to do it. But do it under some supervision without huge downsides. You know, we've known that about doctors forever. Nobody wants to go to a doctor and a doctor say, oh, oh, welcome. Yeah, you're my first patient. Come on in. <laughs> and you would turn and run. But you, and you don't want to hear that from your lawyer either. So that led to me starting the California Innocence Project. And we started with three missions 20 years ago, and they're the same today. Very simple. Number one, get innocent people out of prison. Number two, create this educational environment that works like a medical school clinic. Click. I think the provost broke this. Let's see if that works. Oh, there we go. And number three is to work on law reforms and policies to lessen the number of wrongful convictions. This is what we've been doing every day for two decades. And we've walked 26 innocent people out of prison. We've trained hundreds of law students to be better lawyers. And we've been involved in a lot of lawmaking and training. In fact, this past year, we were involved in two new laws that are now laws in California. And we're able to be involved in writing those laws. And they're geared towards assisting us in our work and assisting exonerees when they get out of prison. When I started the project, there were about five projects operating in the world doing this type of work. There was Centurion Ministries was the first one in New Jersey. Then there was the Innocence Project in New York. Then there was one in Wisconsin, one in Chicago, one in Washington, and us. And today we have more than 60 of these organizations in the United States. And I sit on a board that oversees um, all these projects. And we also have them all around the world. Um, we have them in all these different places. I mean, you look at some of these countries on this list, I mean, we can't kid ourselves that we have the best criminal justice system in the world. That we just don't, okay? If you spent any time in Japan, if you spend any time in Holland, where we have projects, you see a tremendous more resources put into their system. And they're much smaller systems, so they don't make as many mistakes. Just like anything, when you're doing it in bigger volumes, you make more mistakes. And yet we have successful projects in Holland, in Japan, that are exonerating people. Uh, this is a global problem. And the sooner we just face up to that and say, hey, mistakes happen. Let's work together to change that, the better this will all be. And again, going back to, you know, I'm so happy to see the Conviction Review Unit from LA here. 20 years ago, we didn't have criminal defense attorneys and prosecutors in the same room talking about these problems. And now that we do, we're having more solutions. Between the work of all our projects, we've freed hundreds of people from prison, um, like Tim Atkins here, which is an LA case, who uh, went to prison for 23 years for murder he did not commit in Venice. Um, that's Tim walking out a few seconds after he got out of prison. That's a much younger Justin Brooks with nice brown hair, <laughs> thick and wavy. And that young woman on the bottom left is Wendy Cohen. And Wendy was the key to that case. She spent months to track down the key witness in that case and bring her forward. And we miraculously, 23 years after this conviction, were able to bring in the key witness in the case 
and we got the case back in front of the original trial judge, which is another miracle, just that the judge is alive 23 years later. And he understood the context of the evidence and freed Tim. But Tim went to prison when he was 17. And on this day, when we walked him out, he's 40. I mean, for those of us over 40, just think about that for a second, losing those kinds of years of your life. And you can see how overwhelmed he is. I don't think it was until this moment he realized he was getting out. He was in pretty denial that it was actually going to happen. And then he was out. We receive five, 6,000 pieces of mail a year. And we relieve, receive at least 1,500 new requests for assistance. So a big part of our job is screening through cases, looking for the needle in the haystack, looking for the case where we both believe they're innocent and we believe there's the possibility of proving their innocence. And that's the toughest part of this. And a lot of those cases, there's some pretty decent evidence that they're innocent, or maybe we sit with the inmate and we really believe they're innocent, but there's just no way to ever prove it. And so that's the tough part of our job. We close lots and lots of cases. Of those 1,500 cases, there might be 100 that get into any kind of serious investigation. There might be five or 10 a year that get filed in some court. And if we have a good year, we walk two or three people out of prison. Actually, that's a great year. Good year for us is to walk somebody out of prison. And so it is tough, tough to find those cases and end up unringing the bell. And that's literally what we're doing is unringing the bell. Because once you're convicted of a crime in the United States, it is very difficult to undo that process. We get cases from all kinds of people. The best cases we get are when police officers come into our office and say, there's a case I want to tell you guys about. Maybe it's something they worked on years before. Maybe it's something currently in their department. But we have police officers come to us with cases. We have district attorneys come to us with cases. We have a very close relationship in San Diego with Bonnie Dumanis, our DA. I sit down and personally review cases with Bonnie. And Bonnie has brought cases to me, not me bringing them to her, saying, I think this is something you guys should look at. And that's the way the process should be. And that's what's happening now in LA with the Conviction Review Unit. We're actually working together to look at these cases, find out if we believe they're innocent, and, find, and figure out if we can do something about it. Most of the work that our students are doing in our project is investigation work. Um, it's, it's one of the misnomers that our students are you know, spending all their days writing appellate briefs. They're mostly out doing field work because what drives these case is, cases is evidence of innocence. So they're out looking for the facts that we need. They talk to the original trial lawyers and appellate lawyers. They read through the briefs and transcripts. They spend hundreds, thousands of hours reading documents. This is why, and this part of it, by the way, is why we couldn't do the work without law students, because we couldn't afford it. You can't afford attorney hours to do the hours our students put in. Um, and the miracle about this is, the students actually pay to do it. <laughs> it's just unbelievable to me. <laughs> students go out to the crime scenes. Students interview all the witnesses that we can find from the original case. They go out and visit the clients in prison. They track down any physical evidence that exists. And if we put enough of a case together, we either work together with the district attorney's office on a case, or we file in court. Usually it's a state habeas petition. And if we can meet the standard for that, we can get the person out of prison. Now, by the way, one of the laws we've worked on for the past several years that came into effect January 1st is California is now no longer the hardest state in the nation to reopen a case based on factual innocence. And that was shocking to a lot of people in Sacramento when we explained to them, by the way, California is tougher than Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Tennessee. We are number one. Because in California, and I know this because I wrote a law review article on the topic and read every one of those damn statutes, California was the only state in the United States where you needed evidence that completely undermined the prosecution's case and pointed unerringly to innocence. In most jurisdictions, the standard was, do you have new evidence that had the jury heard it, they wouldn't have convicted your client? That is nowhere near enough. That's been nowhere near enough in California for the past 20 years to get a case reopened. You have to knock out every element of the case. So if there's still some evidence in there, there's a good chance the judge is going to deny you 
even though a jury would have never convicted your client based on that evidence. And yeah, that's, we could debate that, but we don't have time. But that's not the standard anymore. And so if we can prove our evidence, we walk our client out of prison. And here's one of those great days um, with Ken Marsh, who was in prison for the death of his girlfriend's baby. That's his girlfriend standing next to him with red hair. It's me again hiding in the back. Uh, and Ken spent 20 years in prison for this. And his girlfriend said for 20 years, the baby fell off the sofa. This was not an abuse case. And we were finally able to get the evidence together to uh, we worked with Bonnie Dumanis in San Diego. We got three neutral experts to review all the evidence, and we all came to the conclusion that he was innocent and walked him out of prison. Imagine that. 20 years in prison as a baby killer is as bad as it gets. Uh, Ken had to be locked down so much in protective custody because you get killed in prison for being a baby killer that when he got out, he had all kinds of spatial disorders because he was in a closed cell 24-7. Uh, I had to hold his hand across streets with him because everything was going so fast. He'd never been on the main line. He'd never been in general custody. Um, it's very, very difficult. And we now know that there are 2,000 documented cases of innocence in the United States. So we are past the initial debate, which was, are there innocent people in prison? And believe it or not, for those of you under 30, that was the debate 20 years ago. Are there even innocent people in prison? Or is this happen at once in a blue moon? Well, we now know 2,000 cases. You can look at the, ex the Registry of Exonerations, which is academic research on this topic. The guys who put it together are very serious scholars. When we have an exoneration, they call us and drill us with questions, make us send all the documentation. They don't take our word that the person's innocent, and they only put it in their database if they're assured that it was a factual innocence case. And now we're here into the thousands. So now it's time we, where we can study these things and figure that out. Oh, and by the way, the US government has admitted that 4% of people on death row have been factually innocent. On death row. So you know, think about that for a second. Those are the cases that get the most attorney work, the most investigation, bifurcated trial, the most media attention, the most focus. So 4% of the capital murder cases, there are innocent people there. Think about how many of the low-level crimes where there's not that kind of attention and what that number is. Um, I always say I'm a moderate on this issue. You know, the two extreme positions are everyone in prison is innocent, and the other extreme position is everyone in prison is guilty. I'm a moderate. Most people in prison are guilty. And now we've got to figure out where is that line and who falls on the other side of it. So we've been looking at those exonerations to figure out why are innocent people convicted. And, and a line that Peter Neufeld uses from the New York Innocence Project that says, you know, when there's a plane crash, we want to find out why did the plane crash so that more planes don't crash. And these wrongful convictions are plane crashes. So we've started to study them to figure that out. And we were very surprised by the results from the first 300 DNA exonerations so these are the gold standard of exonerations as to what caused those wrongful convictions. And what's the number one cause? Yes, we have an expert here today to talk about it. Numero uno is bad identification. Now you're gonna hear about the science behind it and a lot of you have probably studied it, but you know what? It's pretty simple at its first level, the first level of understanding of it. And the first level of understanding is when somebody walks in a courtroom and says, I'm 100% sure that's the person who did it, that's very powerful evidence to a jury. But we now know it's actually very weak evidence in reality. So there's a real disconnect between the quality of that evidence and the perception of that evidence. And that's why I think we have so many of these cases. Some, like Raphael here, you're going to hear about, based on just a single witness on an old photograph. And that's enough to convict you. And if that's enough to convict you, you're going to get a lot of convictions. This, by the way, is the lineup from the death penalty case I talked to you about of Marilyn Malero. Now, if you're looking at this lineup, by the way, who would you exclude from it? 
just looking at it. You say, who here doesn't look like they're concerned about being charged with a double homicide and potentially facing the death penalty? <coughs>
Sumner, from my co-presenter, is an expert on IT. So I'm not talking about things with it. Uh, this is my favorite lineup, really, of all time. Who's the suspect in this lineup? And this is a real lineup, not from Reno 911, from a wrongful <laughs> conviction. Who is the suspect? Shout out a number. And don't overthink it. What did you say? 12. Yes, I'm 18. I can't hide him again. I can't hide my other guy. No, folks. The guy in the headlock. The guy with three police officers holding him in the lineup. That's how you kind of telegraph guilt. That's a bad idea. All right? So if you take anything away from this presentation today, if you're ever in a lineup, don't do this. Don't try to fight your way out of the lineup. You'll be bringing a lot of attention to yourselves. In fact, everybody stand up. Let's practice. It could happen someday. Stand up. Let's practice if you're ever in a lineup. How are you going to do it? Disappear. Desaparecido. Come on. Disappear. Disappear. See, I'm going to a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Neutral. You don't want to look menacing? You don't want to look happy? Maybe you do want to look happy. I'm not crazy happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to go through all this stuff about memory and how it works. As a lot of you know, I think we're going to talk about it. But I do want you guys to think about it if you're students. I'm amazed at how many students don't know what kind of learners they are and figure that out. Like when I was in college, I figured out I was an audio learner, not a visual learner. So I just stopped reading books. I recorded everything and then listened to it. When I studied for the bar exam, I didn't read any of the bar materials. I just listened to lectures because I'm an audio learner. I remember things I hear. I don't remember things I see as well. And by the way, most men fall in that category. That's why women read more books. Uh, that's why men can remember stupid lines from movies. <laughs> that's why all you learners. <laughs> you all should, should use all your senses. Uh, because visual and audio is not our best sense. Our best memory sense is what? Smell. How many of you use smell to study? You could. Professors talk about something really complicated and you're not sure you're going to remember it. You take that really smelly eraser and put it next to your nose and go, And then on the exam, you can't remember, what the hell was that again? Put that thing in front of your nose. You got it. You're attaching memories and experience. And you use all your senses to do that. Memory is a reconstructive process, you don't have it in its entirety. And because it's reconstructive, uh, we also get it wrong a lot. Because sometimes we reconstruct things wrong. And we'll t I'll talk about some cases where that's happened. <clears throat> you know, you know, it's easy to just, you can even change your own memories if you want to. How many people here, now be honest, how many people here have told a story like five or six times and you changed the fact so you look less responsible or more responsible, or whatever it is, about that fifth, sixth time, you don't remember what the truth is. <laughs> Come on, everybody's done. Yes. How crazy is that? You've actually distorted your own memory. And with children, you can easily distort their memories. And it's a lot of fun. So, like, if you've got a four or five year old relative and they want to go to Disneyland, you can convince them in two or three suggestions that you already took them. <laughs> and it goes like this. So like you bought her a little girl a red shirt last year, you say, remember that red shirt I bought you at Disneyland? And attach the false memory with the real memory, and they'll be a little confused, and then immediately hit them with another one. Say, remember that cherry Coke I got you, and you got it in a movie theater, but then say, at Disneyland? And they're like, oh my god. And by the third or fourth one, they think they went to Disneyland. <laughs> it's cheaper, there's no lines. <laughs> My kids have no idea what's true from their childhoods. Grow up in the nation. So you can distort memories very easily. And contamination can happen all along through the criminal justice process. So as a defense attorney, I have questions about all three phases of memory, which you're going to hear about, because they can all create contamination and distorted memories. Um, Arm smoke is going to hear about from our expert here. You know, focus is the most important thing about memory because we only remember what we focus on.
sin and fault gain, no memory. Without focus, there is no memory. Without focus, there is no memory. You'll only remember things you're focused on. So for you students, I'm sure even last night you were reading a book for class and you were tired and your eyes were going from left to right. But you got nothing. And after like five minutes, you're like, I hope I remember nothing I just read two pages. Because you aren't focused on it. Without focus, there is no memory. All these things are kind of important to the crime. What was the person focused on? What was going on at the time of the crime? What are they going to remember? What can they do to this <coughs> You're going to hear about cross racial identifications and the issue with that. I can just tell you on that point, half the people we've walked out of prison were convicted based on cross racial identifications. It's a huge problem in Southern California because and that doesn't make them necessarily better. It just means it's more likely to be cross racial identities going on. Although it's worse in Argentina. I was, I was doing a training down there and we were talking about identifying Asian people. And those of you who speak Spanish know that like what do you call someone who's Japanese? China. What do you call someone who's Thai? China. What do you call someone who's Chinese? China. It's all China. It's all Chinese. So it's like if an Asian person commits a crime in this town, what happens? You know, they could be Thai. They're going to be identified as Chinese, first of all. And then this guy said, yeah, but it's no problem. And I said, why? He says, it'll be that Chinese guy who runs that restaurant in town. I literally was going to go by there and tell this guy, dude, you should move. Because any Asian person rolls through this town and commits a crime, you're going down for it. There's huge problems. OK. And we also, let's show, show a few fun things. And we see what we expect to see. There's a lot of things to do with perception that our brains, our brains are constantly trying to figure out the world, what's going on, right? So I say this young girl, you see a young girl, I say it's an old lady, you're more likely to see an old lady. I say this is the back of an Eskimo, you're more likely to see that. I see it's a Native American head, you're more likely to see that. A lot of things with suggestion that change what we see. If I tell all of you, say Paris in the spring, everyone say Paris in the spring. Paris in the spring. Paris in the spring. How many people see Paris in the spring up there? Raise your hand. Okay? This is why you should not edit your own work. Because that says Paris in the, the spring. And by the suggestion, it distorts what you're seeing as reality. This is why kids, another study tip, don't edit your own work if you can avoid it. And if you are going to edit your own work, put it down for a while, let the memory dissipate, let the coding disappear, and then you're more likely to read it and see the mistakes. If you read it a year later, you'll think like, yeah, this is crap. If you read it like a day later, though, you'd be a better editor. It's all about coding your brains on this stuff. Your brains are easily confused. You see things that don't exist, like the green dots up here that aren't there, with the white and black dots in the middle. Looks like this thing's moving, it's not. Looks like this is moving, it's not. This is my favorite one. Have you guys seen this on the internet? Take a look. This proves how we're constantly trying to figure things out and we get it wrong. Look at the woman on the left. And now look at the woman in the middle. Are they moving the same direction? Now look at the one on the right and look at the middle. Are they moving the same direction? Now go left and look at the middle. Now go right and look at the middle. Now go left and look at the middle. How are you doing that? How are you changing the direction the middle one is moving with your brain? You're not. It's just your brain is trying to figure it out just like it's doing all the time. We don't see everything that's in front of us. We see what our brain understands. We see what our brain conceives of. And lots of times, it's wrong. These cars are all the same size. I have no idea how this works. <laughs> I'll see this one. How many people see a blue and black dress? How many people see a white and gold dress? How can that possibly be? I don't know. Maybe the expert will tell us. But all I know is, Perception, reality, it's all just created in our brains. We see different things. The world is not the same. This is actually hard to do. If you read these colors, you can do it at your leisure time. But trust me, that's hard. Because your left and right side of your brain are in conflict. When you're saying the word and it's a different color, and you try to say the color without reading the word, it's actually hard to do. And this is my favorite one. Films are plays that are produced after years of personal effort and unique knowledge, frankly, out of hard work. Silently to yourself, count the Fs. Okay? How many people 
you'll show five Fs. Raise your hand. Six Fs. Raise your hand. Seven Fs. Raise your hand. Eight Fs. Raise your hand. Nine Fs. Raise your hand. Ten Fs. Raise your hand. Eleven Fs. Raise your hand. How is that possible? <laughs> I'm in a room full of literate people who read English, and you all have different answers for how many Fs are up there. Now, here's the good news for those of you bumming out that you didn't see them all. Statistically, the people who saw the fewest Fs are the best readers. <laughs> because after you've read in English for years and years and years, you actually stop seeing certain words. And even when you're asked to look for them, you can't see them. So many of you probably didn't even see the word of and didn't see the F in it. And how crazy is that? When I even ask you to look for it, you can't see it. Our brains are not exactly what we think. We're not seeing everything going on. We're not seeing the whole picture. There's lots of ways we get confused. I'm going to talk about this in case. The idea that people are more likely to pick the person who most looks like the suspect and get convinced that's the suspect, but that doesn't mean that is the suspect. And this is a study that showed that went through, everyone picked first this dude, and then we said it's not that dude, they go, okay, then it's that dude. <laughs> not good. Because if that dude didn't commit the crime or isn't in the lineup, the other dude's going to prison for a crime and he didn't commit. Well, let me show you how this works in a real case. Can I get my video guy to play this video? <coughs> you know, yes. How many of you, by the way, my favorite ID exercise is how many of you have ever been in a restaurant? and you order soup. So you order like the broccoli soup. And then th and you're looking right at the waiter, and it's a An emotional light. day for a low. <laughs> it's a bright light, no gun on your face, no fear. And then 30 seconds later, you think, I want the broccoli soup. I want the bean soup. And you turn around, like, who's going to you experienced that? That's the best possible ID situation to be in. Lots of times crimes are at night, there's fear, there's weapons, the ID's done hours later, sometimes days later, sometimes months later. And yet you didn't remember that. A man who spent eight years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. Today he spoke out for the first time since being cleared of all charges. 10 News reporter Bob Lawrence with the two things that made it all possible. 2004 on a residential street like this one in Lemon Grove, events would be set into motion that would turn Uriah Courtney's life completely upside down. This is Uriah Courtney standing with his parents in the courtyard of Donovan State Prison last year. In 2004, a 16 year old girl was grabbed off a of Lemon Grove street and raped. Eyewitnesses identified Courtney as the one who did it. Justin Brooks with Cal Western Law School. Eyewitness identification evidence is not that strong. Nonetheless, Courtney was convicted of the assault as well as additional drug charges and looked at life behind bars at Donovan. But during the trial, the victim testified that her attacker had his face on her clothing. And from that moment on, we all knew there was going to be DNA on her clothing. We just had to get somebody to listen to us. The ones who listened were students at Cal Western Law School as part of the Innocence Project. Fortunately, clothing from the victim still existed. And fortunately, we have the kind of DNA technology today that we haven't always had. DNA testing was done initially, but it was the subsequent more thorough testing on the victim's clothing that pointed to someone else who looked like Uriah. They told me about the results of the DNA testing, and uh, it was one of the best days of my life. This is Courtney on the day he was released, but though he was out of prison, he wasn't exonerated yet of all the charges until now. <laughs> Uriah's mother, Mary, said she wanted to yell out during the trial that her son was innocent. Then Cal Western stepped in. I need to have somebody believe in my son. It was awesome. Uriah went to prison when his son was two. He's now 10. As for the 16-year-old who identified him in court. It breaks my heart, you know, what she went through. I don't hold any grudge against her. He hopes that if she hasn't realized yet he wasn't the attacker, that one day she will. Bob Lawrence, 10 News. As for the man DNA evidence pointed to as being responsible, all the DA's office will say is the case is under investigation. 
So in this case, these 16 year old girls pull off the side of the road, she's sexually assaulted, um, she gets away, she gets to the police, she does an actual <coughs> drawing of the suspect, and she does a drawing of a truck that he may or may not have been in. 15 minutes before, some guy from the truck was staring at her. And this is the drawing that she does of the suspect. This is the drawing of the truck. Okay, set aside for a minute, the guy probably has ears. But that's how basic this is. And in fact, what's significant about the drawing of this guy? What's the one defining factor? He's got a goatee, all right? Even though, by the way, this is the most, I mean, transient aspect of a male's appearance. It's, you know, in the top five things about being a man are experimenting with facial hair, right? It's right up there peeing, standing up, not giving birth, getting paid 22% more. All these things are great about being a guy. Right? So the fact that he has a goatee now, or a goatee later, or a goatee when a picture is taken, who knows? But that's the only defining factor. So they search the neighborhood, they find a truck that's in one of your eyes relatives, his father-in-law's uh, house. Uh, then they get to Uriah because he matches the general description. And this is the photo array that they use to identify him. Now based on that, what's wrong with this photo array? He's the only one who matches that description. Number one's got no facial hair. Number two's got no facial hair. Number three's got no facial hair. Number four, Uriah's got the full goatee. Number five's got no facial hair. Number six has got the little Fu Manchu thing going on. <laughs> so, and actually three's got facial hair, got a little Scooby-Doo thing under his chin. <laughs> That's it. So, this, the, it's the victim is gonna pick the person who most looks like the suspect and most matches the description. And that's what she did. And, but, she made a mistake. Because what happened in this case was, well, this is a miracle, miracle attorney down here in front. She took this case on, and she searched for the victim's clothing, which were not DNA tested. And Alyssa filed a motion for DNA testing, and got it, and tested the clothes, and found DNA, male DNA everywhere we were looking for. Now, her having male DNA that's not Uriah's on her is not that significant, right? And we're not fools. In fact, it's disgusting to think about, but right now you all have DNA on you from other people. Whoever sat on that chair before you, or someone on the bus with you, or you're covered in it. In fact, if you do DNA work, by the way, you'll never go into a hotel room again without taking that quilt off. You take the quilt off, you put the disgusting remote in the plastic bag, uh, there's DNA everywhere. And it was under quilt. But we have a DNA data bank. And so, by working cooperatively with the San Diego District Attorney's Office, we were able to run it through the data bank. And on that day, there were 10, more than 10 million offender profiles in it. And it comes back with a hit on this guy, who lives near the crime scene, is a convicted sex offender, and look at his picture next to our client. That's how you get wrongfully convicted. For me, this is an across racial identification, and these dudes look pretty, look very similar. Look at their forehead. Look at their hair, look at the shape of their faces. They're both around the same age. But it's not the right guy. It's just not the right guy. And fortunately, the clothes weren't thrown out. Fortunately, we got cooperation. Fortunately, we put it in the data bank. Fortunately, we got him out. Or otherwise, Uriah dies in prison, an innocent man. And that's why it's naive to believe this didn't happen for decades and decades before DNA. It's just naive. It's stupid. It's really it's fundamentally stupid. I'm always amazed that some of the same people who complain about the government think, think that work is perfect, right? Better than Apple computers, 100% perfect. Never make a mistake. It's naive. We all make mistakes. We accept it, we own it, we try to fix it. We do the best we can. Um, let me talk about the lineups and the phone line and this stuff. There's also a lot of junk science we're working with now. We actually are working with the FBI on old cases where they're doing uh, lead bullet analysis, reopening some cases where the testimony was false, bite mark evidence, any friends of odontologists here? Before I start crapping all over that. <laughs> some friends of odontologists are basically bored dentists who love CSI and have a lot of time on their hands. All right, I said it. Uh, we have a bunch of these cases. Some of the testimony is highly suspect. A whole lot of people have gone to prison under this, and there's some real quality. All these guys have been exonerated after bad bite mark cases. Very, very common. Um, 
microscopic hair analysis is not good science. Somebody looking through a microscope and saying these two things look the same. There's a lot of problems with that. And there's a lot of new arson science where we're learning that old arson cases were just wrong. Um, and one of the fundamental pieces of testimony we see in a lot of old cases is whenever there's multiple points of ignition, it must have been intentionally set. And we now know that that's false. Because we now know that fire jumps. So a fire can start in the living room, go up to the ceiling, and pass across the room and drop in another spot, and then drop in another spot. And later on, when the fire analysis is done, you'll see multiple points of ignition. So that still can be an accidental fire. Shake and baby syndrome, these are the most tragic cases. Parents, guardians in prison for children that they did not kill. And there's been some overdiagnosis in this area. If you want to learn about it, watch the documentary, The Syndrome. And again, I'm not naive enough to think that people don't kill babies. It does happen all the time. Abuse happens all the time. But there's some of those cases where the diagnosis is just incorrect because it's based on the triad of symptoms that you see in cases, and we now know that that's linked to all these other things could also cause the same symptoms. We've got the subdural hematomas, we got the retinal hemorrhaging, we got these things going on, but there was an abuse in the situation. I don't know, fun stuff about some of our successes. Um, we do some international cases, both Jason Burkow and the Pongs were cases we did overseas. I don't know if you guys heard of the Hans, because they were from LA. They were a uh, Chinese American couple living in Qatar that were charged with the murder of their daughter. Uh, they adopted three kids from Africa, and they woke up one day and their daughter was dead. And the police responding didn't understand how Chinese parents could have black children, so they immediately arrested them for slave trading. And they were just American engineers working on a water project for the World Cup games. Uh, they kind of got into the system a little too far for everybody to back down. So the next thing you know, they're facing the death penalty. And uh, we ended up getting them out last year. Horrible cases. Jason Kendall was our first case we worked on here in LA many, many years ago. Bad ID case. He actually got convicted based on voice identification, where someone in the store where he worked said the robber sounded like him. I don't know what our expert would think about that, but I feel like voice identification is even worse. Banks, where's my video? <laughs> <laughs> Brian Banks, it's probably our most famous case. It's an LA case. Um, uh, we're starting with a story that reads like a movie. It's about a young guy with a promising NFL career derailed by a prison sentence. for a crime he did not commit. Yeah, it took him years to just clear his name, and now he's getting a second chance to pursue his dream. Sports anchor Rob Powers from our New York City affiliate WABC is here with more. So many people rooting for this guy. Really a fascinating story. It's hard not to root for him. The National Football League preseason, it can drag on, but at least one player is enjoying every minute of it. The NFL has quarterbacks, halfbacks, and fullbacks, and this preseason, one very important comeback. 28-year-old Atlanta Falcon linebacker, rookie Brian Banks, is one step closer to making his dream a reality after taking to the gridiron against the Cincinnati Bengals this week. Nice job getting off a block and making a play. It's still one of those situations where, like, you know, it happened. And like now it's just replaying in my head. But this is no ordinary rookie. Banks joined the Falcons after spending five years in jail and five on parole. Why? He was wrongly convicted of raping a high school classmate. In May 2012, justice was served. The verdict for Banks overturned the new ruling, not guilty. But people who are going to dismiss this case for so exceptionally in life may not ever get the answers as to why I was supposed to go through what I went through. But I know that I'm here today and I remain unbroken. And you know, you look at the NFL right now with all the stories that are out there, the arrests, the Aaron Hernandez saga that's played out in front of us in the media based on the hope that he has shown all of us, I wouldn't bet against Brian Bank. Before the charges, Banks was a high school football star headed to the University of Southern California on a full scholarship to play for one of college football's best teams. 
But now what's in the past is in the past. I will take this opportunity and be the best person that I can be in this world and show people that no matter what you go through, there is light at the tunnel. The truth is that Brian committed no crime that day, that he's a strong young man with an amazing future, and we want to get him back on track. And back on track he is. Banks signed with the Falcons in April and picked up two tackles in Thursday's game. Definitely one of the best moments of my life. It really is something. So it is up in the future. The Falcons open the regular season September 8th. And Brian Banks may be a long shot to make the final roster, but, you know, that's okay. He has beaten the odds before, and no one, no one is betting against him this time. It's an here. incredible story. His mom stood by his side throughout Every his Every step of the way, yeah. and now it's paying off. Yeah. Right. A great story. Great to have you. Nice to see you this morning. Morning. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it's it. My pleasure. it's such a stark example of how innocent people plead guilty. And in Brian's case, the 17-year-old kid, he's, he gets arrested for this rape. He sits in juvie for a year waiting trial. His lawyer keeps presenting to him options, plea bargains, <coughs> and keeps saying, I'm innocent, I'm not playing, I'm innocent, I'm not playing. Day of trial, it's presented to him, look, I got a great deal. Take this deal, you could get probation. Worst case scenario, you're doing a couple more years in prison. But if you go into that courtroom, you're looking at 44 years to life. It's an all white jury, and I think you're getting convicted. And by the way, I'm not blaming the defense attorney for saying those things, because they could very well be true. But when you're facing such a tremendous sentence, at a certain point, it doesn't necessarily become relevant whether you're innocent or not in your own head. It becomes a business decision. Like, do I take door number one? and roll the dice and hope for the best, but I might die in prison, or pick door number two, where they're telling me I'm gonna get home, I might get back to football, I might get my life back. So he pled out, and he went to prison. And then years later, she comes forward, admits it never happened. And innocent people, and again, I'm not naive enough to believe that most of the people are pleading are innocent people, but I do believe it does happen, and we need to look at our system, because there's something wrong with innocent people. <coughs>
rocket ship going through. You know, <laughs> yeah, just uncharted territory. Yeah, just an incredible rush. It doesn't seem, I guess, actually real yet. The mile high, right there. The mile high, big two cheeseburger. Yeah, make a combo. 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 Make a combo